Welcome to this interview as part of Carlow County Council's Decade of Centenaries 2020 programme. I'm Dermot Mulligan, Museum Curator of Carlow County Museum, and I'll be interviewing Professor Eulon O'Halpin of Trinity College Dublin on his new publication about Kevin Barry, an Irish rebel in life and death, on behalf of Carlow County Council Decade of Centenaries Committee. Professor Eulon O'Halpin, it's lovely to be talking to you on this the occasion of the publication of your new book on Kevin Barry, a rebel in life and in death. And it's obviously at the time of his 100th anniversary of his execution on the 1st of November in 1920 in Mountjoy Jail for his role in the Irish War of Independence. Firstly, congratulations on the publication of your new book. Thanks very much. It's not just a book written by a historian, it's also a book written by somebody who is family connections to Kevin Barry. You might explain to us firstly how you are related to Kevin. Well, Kevin's eldest sister, uh, Kathy, or Kitby, as she was known in the family, was my grandmother. And she was, uh, in some ways, the sort of, you call her the sergeant major uh, of the family. She, she had a lot of delegated authority from her mother uh, to manage uh, the younger children, include, including Kevin. And I think her authority over the family was enhanced by the fact that they were in some ways split because uh, the younger ones were down in, in Carlow most of the time, the, on the family farm in Tom Bay, while the younger ones from, from uh, Cathy herself uh, spent most of her life in Dublin and only visited Carlow, uh, you know, recreationally and so on. And she had the older children effectively under her charge in Dublin, including Kevin. Although Michael, I should say, Kevin's older brother uh, was destined for the farm, so, so on the farm he stayed. Was she an austere kind of character or just one of those people who had, listen, you look after the family and just did what you had to do? I wouldn't call her austere. I think uh, my impression of her, of course, is colour by my own recollections of, of a very uh, grand uh, old lady. Um, I wouldn't have said she was austere, but she was the kind of person, you can see it throughout her life and in her correspondence, where she's trying to fix other people's problems, sometimes almost before they arise. Uh, I quote in my book letters from my mother and, and other people and from a, the memoirs of a family friend. For example, in the 1940s, he was a college friend of, of, of Kitby's son, Paddy, and she, she deliver, he deliberately didn't mention to her that he had dropped out of college and was looking for a job for fear that she would immediately get him one. So she was like that. She was very, if you like, activist and interventionist. It came naturally to her and she was very used to, uh, she was very comfortable with exercising authority, if you like. And in terms of your, say, growing up, did Kevin and such stories of Kevin feature in your family when you were growing up? I, I, they did to some extent. I mean, I, I, I'm, I'm one of her four grandchildren. Uh, my, her, her daughter, Mary, my mum, I was the only one of her children who actually uh, had children or set, children themselves. Um, and we heard quite a lot of Kevin. Uh, uh, he was certainly invoked a good deal. If you cut your knee in my grant near, my, near Kitby, so if you were facing some ordeal, you'd be told, uh, you know, to, 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 to cope with things like a brave Republican soldier and so on. And Kevin definitely was, was part of her frame of reference the whole time. And the puzzle for me, as I point out in my book, is... Kitby's husband, uh, Jim Maloney, his brother Paddy was killed in Tipperary in May 1921, and there wasn't a word about him. There wasn't a word about her. Kitby's father-in-law, PJ Maloney, who was, you know, a, a middle-aged man. He was a hunger, three hunger strikes. He was a member of the first oil. So Kevin very much occupied her, her sort of historical frame of reference, and she's really said very little about her own role, which was quite significant, particularly in the Civil War. It was all about, about her lost brother. And you think that's because of the dramatic impact of what happened to him and how it happened? I do. I, th I think it's it's because she was the person in the family who, in a sense, managed uh, Kevin's imprisonment on behalf of the family. And I, I think that, uh, I, w I wouldn't say she felt guilty, but I think she felt uh, a degree of concern that, that, uh, that, that fate took Kevin in the way it did, because he wasn't, he wasn't, he was in jail for, for a total of almost six weeks before he was executed. And for the first week or so, the family were told by IRA GHQ not to, not to go near him, so they didn't. And so he was left, uh, with the best will of the world, he was left on his own, a very young man in a very 
a difficult situation to, to work out uh, his own strategy and, and perhaps he didn't the strategy he chose was heroic but perhaps it wasn't the, wasn't necessarily the be- the best one in terms of uh, of his of his own life literally okay we'll return to that subject in a bit in terms of just returning to your own childhood was there a point in your childhood or in your teenage years when you realized kevin wasn't just a member of your family or a relative that we all you know like every family you have relatives that we talk about whatever they've done but that kevin was something different that in fact everybody knew kevin the world knew about kevin was there a light bulb moment when that hit you no, I think it was there from from early the the, the the through through knowing the song and and the degree of recognition that the song the version that I'm familiar with, uh, uh, you know that was universally uh, recognised certainly in, in anywhere I was as a kid and even as a young man even as I remember hearing an ex are you see man singing it at a dinner. Uh, maybe about 20 years ago in Belfast, it really has a wide register. Secondly, the photograph, the images, in particular those of him in a hoop sports jer- jersey. Some of them, ironically, it's referred to often as a rugby jersey, but in some of the shots, he's actually, one of the shots, he's holding a hurley, although you don't see it in, in the detail. Uh, he clearly, the sort of iconic uh, element in that has become, became, it was already very powerful by the time I was a kid. And uh, you, you would see it quite a lot. So you saw it obviously on the stamps issued it on the 2nd of November, 1970, for the 50th anniversary. So he was around a lot. But I would say as a student in particular, I, I wasn't that interested in Kevin when I came to university to study history because he seemed like, a, as I say, like a plaster saint with, with, with the rosary beads in one hand, you know, and as a jammed automatic in the other and a rope around his neck. And it was only Donald O'Donovan, whose daughter Shifra has now done just published a book herself about Kevin. It was his book in 1989 that made me realize that Kevin was a real person, that he wasn't, uh, in in terms of his behavior and outlook, he was irreverent, uh, he was humorous, uh, he was a reasonably pious Catholic, but he wasn't a holy Joe, he was forever, not just chasing women, but interestingly, he was able to talk to women, which not that many young men could then or can now do. Uh, and uh, he was inclined to, to drink when possible and, and get up to get up to mischief. So he turned out to be a much more interesting character. And then Donald's book also published, uh, referenced some of his letters, which uh, from prison, which are which is somewhere very powerful, precisely because he doesn't dwell on his own sad state, and because the fact that he uses humour a lot and li- a lightness of touch to, to convey to convey his feelings. So he he turned out to I think Donald's book. Uh, it was a turning point for me and making me uh, interested in him rather than sort of slightly embarrassed by the very Catholic way, the old martyr for old Ireland, all that kind of uh, language in which he was sometimes presented, not by my grandmother, but by the sort of general public and by that well, song. Fair enough. As a matter of interest, is he a Carlovian or a Dubliner? Oh, I think he's definitely Carlo. I don't know if there's any doubt. I know he's born in Dublin, but he was schooled in Carlo. He he was a uh, one of the reasons I think he was suitable for rugby is I suspect is because he was on the farm in the summers. So he was, you know, he had a healthy summer. You know, whatever people on farms do in the summer, it's a lot of physical work. Uh, uh, I think it gave him an insight as well into 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 knowing rural as well as urban life. I think is quite was quite important for him. And I think he's definitely, I, I've no, no doubt, contrary to what my grandmother says in her Bureau of Military History statement, I think his views were probably far for, formed uh, in, in Carlow uh, rather than in Dublin. I think they came from his parents. Uh, his sister Shell writes that, that morning, noon and night, her parents and Kevin's parents were constantly throwing their eyes to heaven at people who, who sought employment you know, under the crown and so on. At best, they were sorry for them. At worst, they sneered at them. So I think there's a strong sort of rebel ethos, uh, probably dating at least to 1798 and so on, uh, in Carlow and in the traditions of Carlow and Wicklow. And I think that that is why, um, that's what formed Kev- Kevin's views uh, just as much as uh, what he heard when he actually came up to Dublin to, to be a secondary school boy. And on that then, would the school principal, a well-known school principal in Carlow, who was in Radville at the time, Edward O'Toole. Would Edward have had uh, influence on Kevin and the Barry family through his role as school principal? 
I, I don't know. I, I would guess so. I do know that he wrote, he actually wrote some what you call antiquarian articles to do with do with uh, prehistoric monuments and so on around Carlo, I think including one on, on the Barry's land. So he was a, a, an educated and scholarly man. He wasn't simply a sort of tub thumping nationalist or whatever. And um, but the little we know about him, which is my case is largely from, from Donald's book, uh, seems to suggest that he was uh, uh, an enlightened as well as uh, uh, an educated figure, and he must have passed on some of that. But I think the home is very important as well, and what you hear at home and the sort of tunes in your head, as it were. And it seems to me that Kevin, Kevin had, had quite, uh, Carlo was exposed to rebel, if you like, tunes rather than to conformist crown tunes. Okay. Why then did he go to Dublin to school and maybe not into Carlow Town for secondary school? Well, I, you know, I, I, there are several reasons for this. Obviously, the, the, the family had a base in Dublin, the dairy in, in Fleet Street, which in, a, in some ways had to be manned by, by family members anyway. Uh, I think secondly, certainly here, uh, Kevin's, Kevin's mother, who I learned a lot about while, while doing my book, although my book is kind of shortened because because of COVID, there were archives I wished to hit at the last minute, which of course I couldn't do. But Kevin's mother seems to be, on the one hand, a very strong woman, but, a very, but quite a retiring woman uh, who was willing to give her eldest daughter, uh, Kitby, my grandmother, a lot of authority. And I think Kitby, once she, when she saw the bright lights of Dublin, while she remained very fond of Tom Bay and Carlo in particular, she became a, a rather cosmopolitan figure. Uh, Todd Andrews, uh, an IRA man in his memoirs, described seeing her in 1923 in the wilds of West Cork, not knowing who she was. She was actually coming from De Valera to see Liam Lynch, but she stops outside the cottage where they're based to apply to apply lipstick. And as Andrews says, uh, in, in, to see a woman applying lipstick in, in, in you know in the wilds of Cork would seem bizarre. And even in Dublin, most Republican women weren't sort of like that. Whereas K Kitby was very glamorous, uh, very urbane and metropolitan, if you like, in many ways. And I'm convinced that she wanted her, her you know, the second son, who traditionally in Irish, in comfortably off Irish families, is going to get the education anyway, because he's not getting the farm. She wants him to get the best education possible. And I think that's one of the reasons why he's initially put in O'Connell schools, a Christian brother school, which was actually academically strong, but it was somewhere, for social reasons, an ambitious family wife might Typically, they send boys there for a while and then send them off for a bit of sort of polishing in, in, in a sort of a socially superior school, like in, in Kevin's case, St. Mary's College in Rathmines. But he was there for a year and the college closed. I don't know for what reason, the secondary school. And so, the, the, but Mary's would have done him, I suppose. But then to then Belvedere, which was a Jesuit school and therefore another uh, notch up, uh, which is where he spent his last three years of secondary school. And that undoubtedly, uh, conferred a kind of a social uh, cachet uh, upon him, which I'm afraid, however good the secondary school in Carlo was, wouldn't have done the same job. In terms of then, he moved on to the National University of Dublin, now UCD. Do we know why he chose medicine? No, but it, again, it, it is almost, a, it, it's quite a, almost in a sense, it, it, I would have said medicine and the law for a family like Kevin's, which at the time had a bit, they weren't rich, but they had a bit of money and they had a bit of land. And so you push a second son into the professions and the obvious professions, I would say, particularly for Catholics, uh, would have been, would, would have been, would have been med medicine, medicine or the law. You know, that was, that was, they were the, the, uh, uh, obvious routes, which were also, they weren't blocked in, in, in sort of in denominational ways the way others might have been, and they didn't necessarily imply that you were, for example, that you, that you were going to become a servant of the crown by becoming an official or whatever. You could make your way uh, as a Catholic uh, a professional person, uh, whether in medicine or, or dentistry, because Kevin was re registered to be uh, potentially a dentist as well. I don't know how quite the mechanisms by which you chose. Do we know within all that what influenced him to join the volunteers? Well, I think the two things, I think his brother Mick, who, who, who again I learned a bit about uh, through, through, through doing this book and who I met, who I remember as a very nice, uh, quiet, humorous man. I only met him a couple of times when I was a kid. But uh, his brother Mick had joined uh, the volunteers in Carlo, I think before Kevin did in Dublin. And so there may be a bit, if he can do it, I can do it. 
Secondly, I think by 1917, the family as a whole, certainly the older kids, were quite, uh, they being, they, I think they were already set on a road of, of, of advanced nationalism before the rising, but I think the rising and its consequences undoubtedly uh, confirmed them in their beliefs. Uh, I think Mick's decision to join the volunteers in some ways is, is, is he had more to lose and the family had more to lose through him joining because he was the he was the mainstay of the family. He was working the farm on which the family's well-being depended. He was effectively paying Kevin's school fees and so on. So it was a big decision for him as the only as the eldest son of a widow uh, uh, to, to to commit himself to the volunteers as as well as uh, you know to 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 working that quite big I think eighty something eighty six acre farm. So again, that I think that reinforces the Carlo Carlo idea as distinct. My grandmother says they had a wonderful old Fenian housekeeper in Dublin, but Mick wasn't uh, exposed to her. So I, I think that that's where the republicanism comes from. And the fact that he was only about fifteen or so when he joined would that have been unusual, or was it open to anybody and everybody who wished to play their part? I think in practice, uh, and that's where there's a, a bit of double standards about the arguments about you know of his extreme youth when he's awaiting execution. Uh, um, uh, the the uh, I suppose he could have joined the Fianna, but I suspect that the, the, the Dublin volunteers were rebuilding after the rising, and they would take anybody. Um, I knew Todd Andrews slightly, C.S. Andrews who, who, from Dublin, who, who also joined the volunteers at 15. Now, I don't think age, uh, once you're old enough and your mother would let you, or your mother didn't find out in Kevin's case because she was in Carlo, I don't think they were overly worried at all by sort of technical child protection issues or anything that would arise now. And we know in those early years before the famous incident at Monk's Bakery, how active was he? I think this again. I've only was only thinking about this through, through doing doing the book uh, and through. I, I've just completed a very big study called the Day of the Irish Revolution, which will be out next month. Uh, and the the point about Kevin is that by, by the standards of an average IRA volunteer, he had a very extensive uh, range of experience as compared with most people. Particularly now, if you take away the 1916 veterans, uh, most most people. Uh, most people, even people who got IRA medals subsequently, a large number of them would never have fired a shot. It's not a judgment against them, it's just the nature of the conflict and also the shortage of weapons and so on, which is a chronic problem uh, for the IRA. Uh, and, and Kevin was, was uh, initiated, if you like, into, into active operations in Carlo uh, before he was in Dublin, uh, and he was on a surprising number. Now, some of them uh, were not as dramatic, uh, they, but one of them involved a shootout in some ways, politically incorrect, a shootout with the Protestant clergyman, another, another involved breaking into the what had been the home of John Redmond at gunpoint and uh, threatening the occupants and so on. Uh, uh, he'd, 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 he'd done a surprising amount for, by, by the standards of most, most volunteers uh, by the time of the Monk's Bakery Raid. He'd also taken part in a very successful coup, if you like, in the 1st of June 1920, the King's Inns where a British military guard uh, was overpowered by two IRA companies uh, and, and uh, disarmed and their weapons, including two Lewis guns captured. And so he'd, he'd done a lot. He wasn't uh, uh, some kid who said, looking for directions, what do I do now, please, sir, at all. And I remember talking to another relative um, many years ago and they were of the very distinct opinion that Kevin and some members of the Barry family, because obviously of the Fleet Street connection and the dairy, that he had witnessed some parts, possibly the start of the 1916 Rising, which I'm sure would have, at a boy of that young age, would have preaked his interest in wondering what this is all about. Yeah, I don't know about that. It's not clear. It's clear my grandmother was 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 in was in Fleet Street at the statement. I'm not sure whether whether Kevin and uh, his siblings were. Can I just say though? I mean, well, I, there's there's a in the military service pens, pensions records which are amazing. Uh, I'm trying to think of the name now. But there's one Rathvilly volunteer who also joined in 1917, and he points out we had no guns. So that so you have to, we have to realize that that, that the the IRA, the IRA in 1917, 18, 19, and 20 even mostly were, they, they were without weapons. So a lot of their activities were actually to raid houses, for example, of of people who had come back from the war with souvenir revolvers and things, and and to get them. 
and on that then, I suppose, looking at the actual raid itself without going into the major details, because it is well recounted in different forms. And of course, in the incident that it is, it's not something that everybody agrees on the exact details of it. But going on that point about the weapons, we believe that Kevin had left his revolver in Rathvilly and obviously borrowed a revolver in Dublin. And by all accounts, the bullets he had in it were from different sources and different types of bullets. And would that yeah, maybe have caused problems for him in the raid? I, well, I think I think it did. They say some say that because he was a few minutes late uh, when they mustered before the raid, he got given uh, this weapon. Now, the weapon he was given, I mean, there are a number of people who spoke about these 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 Mausers, as they were a German uh, semi-automatic uh, wet pistol. Uh, they're actually regarded as very superior weapons in, in many ways for for close combat. As compared with, uh, with say, with the with the British thirty eight or forty five, but they're much more nicely balanced and so on. But you have to be really careful with them. And one of the difficulties the IRA had was even when you could get ammunition of the right, of precisely the right caliber, if it wasn't, if it was from a mise, if it hadn't all been made together, if each clip didn't consist of bullets manufactured at the same time, there was a tendency to jam. And this is what happened. It appears twice, at least twice, during the monks, monks' bakery engagement for Kevin. He, he, my grandmother has a couple of different versions of this, but it looks as though he fired his gun, it jammed, he cleared a blockage, he fired again, he might have had two further shots, it jammed again, and was while clearing the second blockage under the lorry that he suddenly realised everything had gone quiet and his comrades had left him. There's some, obviously, in the court case subsequent to that, he's found guilty of murder of Private Whitehead. And I suppose the court doesn't determine whether he did or didn't kill Private Whitehead. They sort of collectively say, well, he was part of the raid. And so, therefore, he's guilty as anybody who did fire the shots. What do you or the Barry family believe? Did he fire the fatal shot or not? Well, I mean, I can only say say for what, what what I think myself and what what the the records I've seen and what my also what my grandmother said. I I think he fired. He, he he. My grandmother says that Kevin told her that he that it, that after the first jam he fired and killed a soldier. Now the only soldier killed outright uh, was actually uh, was Washington, who it turned out was fifteen, not nineteen, as the army uh, believed, or at least they pretended to believe, because they were desperately short of recruits. Um, I don't know, but I, th I think uh, I, I did hand the court martial documents and other material to, him, to, to three different senior counsel. I had a look at them, and uh, yeah, uh, another barrister and to an experienced solicitor who's done a lot of courts martials. And they all said, in terms of the le legalities of it, once he didn't, once there was no defence was mounted, he was he was, you know he, he had to he had to be convicted. Uh, and 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 everything followed from that, including uh, obviously the sentence and, and ultimately his execution. But had 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 he been uh, defended, I think it's quite possible not that he would have beaten the charge, but that there would have been enough doubt sown in the minds of the judges. Now these were, aren't professional judges; these are military officers. And a court martial is really designed about it's about discipline. It's about putting manners in, on your men. It's not about abstract justice. So it is a different kind of uh, purpose, uh, but I, I, I think there would have been uh, uh, a strong chance that sufficient confusion because the question of the bullet that was produced in court, uh, it, it clearly came, it probably came from the pistol that Kevin had, but the, the doubts could have been stolen and that might have been enough to get him a, a, you know, a conviction of, of a life sentence rather than a uh, a, a death sentence, but perhaps not, because there were three dead, dead young soldiers, and then um, for the first time uh, since 1916, the authorities had somebody responsible for killing Crown forces against whom they had a, a in some ways, an, 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 an unbeatable case. Would the fact that he didn't recognise the court was that something he took upon himself, or do you think that the volunteers had instructed them at some stage, if you're ever captured, say a uh, Apart from saying nothing, recognise no court. No, I, I think uh, the most they would have been told told uh, beforehand was uh, say nothing till till you till you see us till you see a lawyer because G general headquarters who obviously were busy with other things at the same time I didn't realise until quite close to the end how perilous Kevin's case was uh, uh, did did say he's to be defended he is to mount a defence and they did rather slowly. 
uh, produce a solicitor who, wa who was to mount that defence, who then uh, said he was double booked and so passed on the papers through my grandmother to another to yet another solicitor who actually only spoke to Kevin two weeks before, two days before the court martial. And my, and my view is that if Kevin had spoken to uh, a lawyer three weeks before the court martial, he might well still have uh, decided to proceed in, in roughly the same direction as he did, but he would have been, he would have had a much clearer idea in advance of what was coming and might have been able, might have been advised even on, he was quite polite to the court, but of, of how to look and how to appear and just the tricks of the trade, which might have seen him uh, w win more sympathy. Having said that, it's amazing how, uh, how everybody who dealt with Kevin seemed to get on with him uh, and, and to like him. They, they, there was uh, particularly given, given that he, you know, three young soldiers had died, but he, but after the first beating up on that, he seemed to get on uh, really well uh, with everybody on the on the British and the Crown side, as well as uh, obviously his college friends and family. On that, then, as you're saying that he seemed to be a very affable kind of character, and everybody seemed to like him. But as you say, he did recount at some point then afterwards that there was an account of torture. How much do we put credence on that, that this is just a boy giving out that he was tortured or this was genuine British soldiers' tar tactics to lean on him and get whatever information they could? Well, I, I think, it's, it, I do think it's, it, it comes more, by the standards of that time, it comes more into, into the category of roughing him up, badly roughing him up. They dislocate the, that of what, of, of what would then have been regarded as, as torture. And the whole point about Kevin's affidavit and why it's so convincing is a he he only offered it because he was told uh, by GHQ that he bloody well had to give an account of what had happened to him, and secondly that's such a measured thing. It's not a oh you know they threatened to pull out my eyes or they you know they try threaten to do terrible things to my my genitals or anything like that. It, it's a very very matter of fact and and he, you know he said this was very painful. They knelt to me. They prodded me with bayonets. But if you look at uh, at other accounts, and, and there are so many of these accounts, they, they are not, you know, we can take them broadly, broadly true of, of, of people, many of them not volunteers who, who are being roughed up and not after even after shootings, but just pulled in off the street. And not only in violent parts of Ireland, but in very quiet parts of Ireland, like in Wexford. I think I quote a Wexford volunteer's experience. It's extraordinarily harsh, the treatment they receive. And uh, we would now call it, call, we now, might now call it torture at the time. Uh, as I say, Kevin didn't make much of it, and I think it's greatly to his credit. Uh, he did have a, he a sore arm for some days afterwards, and it, he got it got treated. But he certainly it doesn't seem to have shocked him psychologically. It certainly would me. Uh, but it seems he seems to be very resilient, and it was just something that happened. Somebody else who might not have been impressed with him, but on a less serious note, that afternoon of the raid, he was to have sat his uh, medical exam in UCD, and obviously you're a professor of history and I suppose the academic year it ends up with exams and I suppose you want to see your students doing well. I don't know at what point UCD were notified or realised that Kevin wasn't around or the reason why he hadn't turned up for the exam but you as a professor and you would have come up to the exam hall and you would have seen Kevin Barry's place empty would you just thought well that's him gone for this year or we'll see him again next year or say la vie or would you be annoyed? It's hard to know because because the, these were well. I, I go back to my own experience. Fifty years afterwards, when I when I was a UCD student doing arts, and my sisters were medical students, my older sisters and medical students certainly in the early seventies had still had the reputation of being terrible messers, of being constant. A lot of them came from uh, you know privileged schools and so on. They had a kind of a to an extent, a kind of rugby club ethos. Typically, in the first year or two, loads of them failed loads of exams, uh, but in the end, got their act together. Because after all, it's a six-year course as opposed to a thing. So, so I don't think a, med, a, a, a student in what now we call pre-med then was first med, uh, missing an exam or having to even repeat a year. It wouldn't be, uh, wouldn't have been out of the ordinary, and it wouldn't have been a black mark on them career-wise afterwards. Uh, you know, because medics, medics were like that. They were notorious uh, as 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 undergraduates for not doing the work unless they had to, and so on. And then suddenly getting serious towards the end of their, uh, you know, when they came closer to qualification. I think Kevin was absolutely in that mold. I'm sure if he'd repeated the year, the IRA permitting, he 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 got his exams and gone on. And again, going back to that point of how he got on with people, again from listening to different accounts. 
that he seems to have, again, time in Mount Joy, while obviously he's incarcerated. He's obviously awaiting execution. But again, he seems to be treated fairly by the warders and he seems to get on with them. And in fact, seems to be even sharing his tips for horse racing with them. Yeah, the, the guy, I looked up the horse that uh, my grandmother said, he, he, he the horse, that, that, the tip that he, that, that he gave them. In fact, I, I checked it. I think it's a, a horse called Busy B and the horse actually, or Red B perhaps, the horse actually lost. But still, at least he gave them a tip. No, he seemed, he seemed to have a real talent. And again, I, I, what amazes me is, 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 is from my limited knowledge of mankind, of humankind, he had a particular talent for getting on with people uh, of, bo of, of both sexes and not simply because he had lots of sisters and all that stuff, uh, but he also had a way of relating to women which wasn't simply the sort of schoolboy or sort of a, a juvenile way at all. And that's reflected, I think, in his letters to, uh, uh, to girls when he, when, he was, when he was in prison, particularly his letter to, to uh, Kathleen Carney. Which is a very powerful letter, precisely because he, he's. It's not just oh, it's not a, a kind of gushing letter. It's not a, a particularly sorrowful letter, but it's a very mature. You know, you see, see, you see, he really does seem, and it's and it's a, it contrasts with some of his letters that Donald quoted, uh, kind of kind of more kind of laddish, jockish letters to Bapti Marv, with high and others about seeing a tart in a train and car, you know sitting on a couch or lying on a couch with a Belgian girl and this kind of laddish stuff. But he actually, which is real first med, kind of rugby school type language. But, but whereas uh, when he addressed women directly on paper, he, he was, uh, he seemed to me to address them as people, you know? And while that's all happening in Mountjoy Jail, what's the reaction among his family to a, his capture, his trial and the notification that execution awaits him? Well, I, 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 well, obviously, it's a terrible trauma for, for, for the family. Uh, their father had died in 1908. The, 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 the mother, who I think is clearly a stronger character than she, she, she kind of stays in the background almost deliberately, it seems to me. But if you look at how she brought up her children, both before and after Kevin's death, she obviously, and her, her grandchildren's account, accounts of her, uh, she obviously was a strong person who had, on the one hand, carried this terrible sorrow, but on the other, didn't let it. Uh, uh, overshadow uh, the development of her, her own children's development and so on, and I, I think that's particularly so in 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 the years immediately after 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 Kevin's ex execution, um, and uh, I think it's an example of where, on the one hand, she left a lot of the the management to my to my uh, domineering grandmother, but on the other, she did it uh, in a sense, having chosen my grandmother. Uh, to, to, to carry out, to you know, to, to have that role, and uh, you know, so she she's a Dowling, and uh, obviously originally not a Barry. So I I, I assume there's a, a Dowling narrative as well, which which I don't know much about. I I think the real, I mean, the weight must have fallen particularly obviously on Mick because he's he's just a couple of years older than Kevin, and he's the only other boy, uh, uh, on on Shell who, who's 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 next to Kitby. Uh, who's just a bit older than Kevin, and on Elgin, uh, later Elgin O'Rahilly, who who uh, is only sixteen, but who's very uh, is very involved with Kitby in Dublin in in visiting Kevin and supporting their mother, and in uh, uh, in part of the complicated uh, and a, a talk of of plans uh, to rescue Kevin, in, in which Kitby and Elgin would have been involved, which frankly sounds calamitous. I don't can't imagine they could possibly have worked uh, without producing a bloodbath. But uh, at Elgin, uh, as as was probably the case, can't be talked about Kevin a lot. Kevin, Elgin, I, I know from her children, didn't you know? But she she carried like like her own mother perhaps. She she carried uh, she carried that uh, in pectory as a way like rather than rather than around the place in in in, in public. And different people, as we know, cope with sorrows in different ways. In terms of the execution accounts, and again, there's different accounts from different sides of the of the fold to say that he went bravely, calmly, resolutely to his death. What can we believe? Did he go as calmly as to say he did? Well, there's a terrific report in, in, in a British administrative file, which, which, is, which wasn't going to be made public. Uh, you know, they didn't, you know, forever. Uh, 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 of a warder's account, account to to a, to a British officer who then tells a Dublin Castle official. And if I were to wish for an account of my death, 
be hanged by my enemies. I couldn't wish for anything better. It says the prisoner Barry talked sport mainly in his final hours. That, that when, when hope of a reprieve had vanished, he joked quite somewhat cynically that this only happened in the cinema. I mean, that's that's a kind of an American joke, you know, of the governor suddenly ringing at the last minute as the man's about to be electrocuted. And they say he went to his death with callous composure. You know, what more could you want uh, from your <coughs> from from your foes than, than them to say? And, and uh, you know, I was very relieved when I first saw that in a British file because we had only the the the. the the sort of sympathetic account came from the from the from the prison chaplain who had been rather hostile to Republicans, Canon Waters. But his solution was to turn Kevin into a kind of a saint on earth, right? And you know, I'm sure Kevin did go to his death, uh, 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 murmuring prayers and so on. You know, if I get the chance as I come to death, I'll be praying it to, to as many gods as will listen. You know, uh, but but he but. Uh, I think one of the problems with, is that Kevin's death becomes very Catholicized, uh, uh, probably in parallel with that of Terence McSweeney. And uh, that's unfortunate, certainly in Kevin's case, because he wasn't a holy Joe and he certainly didn't see himself as, as a martyr, this terrible word, uh, which is used uh, not only of, uh, of, of Irish Republican dead. If you look at uh, the Great War dead, British Great War dead, there's plenty of Pope martyrs there. They all nearly all die for God and are now in the hands of God. The British very often critique Irish republicanism for its allegedly sort of religious fixations. But if you go into any uh, 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 Church of England church in, 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 in England or any Church of Ireland church here, you're going to find the dead inside the churches. Uh, you know, I'm not, I'm not complaining about it, but I'm saying every, every uh, religion uh, tends to remember their warrior dead. When you say he didn't want to die as a martyr, do you mean as a religious Catholic martyr as opposed to a Republican martyr who had died for the cause? I don't think he even... I, I, I don't see see that uh, he was, in a sense, a, a, a martyr at all. He didn't... Uh, he chose to take his medicine. He didn't, cho he didn't choose to die. This was his duty. He, 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 took, his, he took his chances, that, it seems to me. I don't, I, and then he found, oh, they're going to sentence me to death. Too, you know, too bad. Can't be helped. I'm not going to ask them not to. You know, okay. and, but the idea of a martyr with all that religious connotation. Funnily enough, the, the British intelligence chief, General Winter, writes about Kevin's death, and they say that it, in terms that we now hear about ISIS bombers, they say that Kevin, Ke, he, Winter claims that Kevin was told that he would have 70-something virgins to meet him in heaven and things. I thought this was, oh, this was a sort of a a radical Islamic trope, whereas Winter's writing it of Kevin, I think in his memoirs of the 1940s. And it's just, it's just nonsense. The IRA GHQ didn't want him, want him to die. They, they wanted him defended. And their, their reasons weren't simply, oh, poor young man. Their reasons were, he's the first. There's going to be loads more going through this new legal process. And the more we can slow it down, the more we can sow doubts in the minds of, of military men who are hopeless legally anyway and are liable to be bamboozled by some tin pot lawyer, uh, uh, the better. It was entirely against the, the IRA's strategic interests uh, for Kevin to be uh, executed. It may have suited, in the outcome, may have been brilliantly used uh, in terms of propaganda and making the case for independence. But in terms of, in terms of defending of the interests of, of IRA volunteers, it was a disaster. Especially one who was experienced and willing to get his hands dirty, so to speak. Absolutely, this was a, this was an experienced person you were losing. It, the irony is you weren't losing a, a, a little boy, I think as one Republican priest called him, poor little Kevin Barry. This is an insult to Kevin. He wasn't like that at all. He was a young man. He wasn't a boy. Part of the problem is the photographs that we're putting into circulation about him, not only they, do they suggest a healthy, sporty type, you know, a team player, not an individual, all that kind of thing. But he looks like a public school boy. And they were all taken at least a year and a half before he actually uh, was captured. So they're, you know, even pictures, you, I'm sure you're still a young man. But if you look at pictures of me when I was 16 uh, uh, versus me when I was 18, I have physically changed a lot. Or 90, I'm nearly 19. Of course, I, you physically change a lot of that age over a over year, let alone over a year and a half. So he looks, he does look very young because he was very young in the photographs that they circulated. 
The irony is the one photograph where he actually looks like a, like a university student, that one taken in 1919, the pillars of the house photograph where he's wearing a trench coat, that only got, according to the, a note on the back of the original print, which is in the Jesuit archives, the photographer says that he, 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 he gave the photograph in 1922 to the Barry family, or rather got their permission to give it to the, the Belvedere Newsboys charity so that they could take the detail of Kevin and put it on a mass card to raise money. And that's where, you know, he got the lock of hair and, and Father McGrath writes on the back saying the, 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 the developers wanted to remove the lock of hair because it looked untidy and Kevin's mother said, no, no, leave it because it's completely characteristic. But that's the one where he looks oldest. But that one wasn't, I think by chance, wasn't in circulation uh, uh, before his death or for over a year afterwards. Absolutely. Conscious that where I'm talking to you from is the first floor gallery of Carlow County Museum and behind us here, McCarbley or otherwise, um, presented by Kevin's nephew to us, Kevin Barry as well, back in the 1980s, is the remains of Kevin's last cigarette that he smoked in Mountjoy Jail. And while you were saying he was openly talking about sport uh, to everybody around him, what do we think maybe was going through his mind when he was smoking that cigarette? Was it of the family? Was it of what's going to happen? Or, okay, I know we don't know, but what might have been? It's hard to know. I mean, his letter to, uh, to Kathleen Carney is, uh, he uses language and he uses it elsewhere. He, he talks about uh, when I cash in, he uses these terms, which are really, you know, terms which have come from the Great War, the First World War. Uh, uh, when my number is up, all those kind kind of terms. Uh, he he obviously knew he, he was heading towards the end. He had no idea what it was like. I suspect he was a, he was concerned that he might break down. So many people. If you look at James Daly in in, in the Connaught Ranger, who's executed the day after Kevin, in 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 northern India, and and Daly plainly, and <clears throat> the curious thing, his executioners also. Everybody wanted to, wanted him to die with dignity. No, nobody wants us to say, oh, he was a snivelling wreck or anything like that. And I think it was almost a convention because it makes the executioners feel better if they say so-and-so went to, unless they're, generally speaking, people speak, speak well of the way in which people went to their deaths. But having said that, there's plenty of evidence uh, uh, of supporting evidence uh, from, from, from different from different sources, if you like, on the British side and the Crown side, to say that he went to his death, you know, is 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 his head held high, as did other IRA men like Thomas Williams, nineteen, who was hanged in 1942 for killing a policeman in Belfast, and so on. But people, but by and by and large, there is a, uh, I think even executioners typically want want their uh, the person to whom they're giving the rope. To, uh, 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 to to go go not just as easily but as proudly as possible. I, I do quote in the book. Uh, uh, it's of course a secondhand story, but 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 but, the, but what's said to be the, the hangman was from Rochdale, a barber from Rochdale, who Ellis who did the hang. What he said to a, a detective uh, in in Hollyhead after after doing doing the the business. He said that boy didn't give a damn. You know, in, in a sense, he was he was willing to die. The immediate impact then of his death on his mother and his siblings then in Dublin and in Carlow. It was terrible. I mean, what? Because it was so long drawn out and where there had been such hope and such false hope. And Cathy Kidby's uh, employer, who, who was very connected to like what you might call to, 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 to well-to-do kind of unionist and southern unionist, uh, families and interests that uh, went over and, and indirectly lobbied Lloyd George and came back thinking that's okay. Uh, all sorts of distinguished uh, people with distinguished war records uh, lobbied the government. There was there was huge pressure. But I mean, from the from the British military point of view, especially General McCready or McCready as they they called him, uh, kept saying we have to hang this chap. And and his reasons for it were firstly three dead soldiers but secondly his argument was if if we can start convicting people who we know to be guilty of these crimes it means we'll be able to keep much better control over our own forces because it is a it is a constant theme 
from 1919, 1920, 1921 in Ireland. The British Army, I'm not praising them, but for professional reasons, uh, senior officers generally were worried about keeping their men under control. And things got worse as the police got out of hand and as the police turned to targeted target killing, as they did in, in parts of Ireland from quite early in 1920. Moss McCurtain being an example in Cork and March, uh, the army were worried that the that their troops would start doing the same. And the difficulty there isn't simply uh, a sort of a moral or an ethical difficulty, it's that these soldiers will get into bad habits and these bad habits will pass on when those soldiers move on elsewhere in the empire. So there's a pragmatic reason why you don't want your troops to misbehave. And I think Kevin uh, the, the pressure from McCree McCready uh, to carry out the execution it, it is, is largely on that basis, rather than because think of the poor families of the of the soldiers who died. Nobody makes that argument, which is a strong argument at all, that they could go to hell. It was it was about military discipline and about finally having caught caught a an IRA man in flagrante, if you like, and uh, giving him giving him uh, what he deserved in, in in British military eyes. And on that, then obviously the IRA, as you say, it had looked to obviously have his case looked at uh, for various reasons, but obviously when the execution took place, that's it, it's done, dusted, he's dead. Obviously, I presume then they think about how do we capitalise upon this? Oh, there's no doubt about that. I mean, it's, it is said that hundreds of UCD students joined the IRA uh, following his execution. I think we have to be careful about that because we'd have to look at, we'd have to do some checking. That's the kind of thing people say. Uh, but there's no doubt that it further embittered the nationalist population who'd already seen McSweeney die. You have two unfortunate hunger strikers who die in court jail almost unnoticed in the same week. One of whom actually was on a hunger strike for longer than McSweeney before, before he, before he, he died. Uh, you have the fact that the Crown forces have, have, uh, are already carrying out reprisals of various kinds, including targeted killings, including the sacklings, you know, Balbriggan, which happens at that time. Tubber Curry had been sacked, Sligo had been sacked following the killing of a policeman. So you already, and, and this was coming from, from London, in particular the Prime Minister Lloyd George and Winston Churchill was, uh, was also a, a very gung-ho member of government. They were quite happy uh, at the idea that the rebel, the Shinners were getting a good kicking and that their supporters was, which meant really the nationalist population generally, because this was putting manners on them because, you know, they'd asked for it and now they were getting it. Tom Bay didn't escape during that period then straight away, especially Mick, his brother. That's right. Well, the house, I'm not sure how many times Tom Bay was raided, but it was certainly was, a, you know, you wouldn't need to be a genius uh, to know that it was, uh, Mick was a senior officer in his battalion, uh, that it was a centre. Uh, for uh, what the Crown would regard as subversion. And, and so Mick was eventually captured, I think it was in, in December 1920. Now, this, the family records and, and the British records don't always line up on these things. Uh, the British say that they also got a car. Now, they might mean a, what we'd call a, a cart, but described as a car uh, full, of, uh, full of bombs, which would be homemade grenades or whatever. Uh, but they got some, I think they, they also claimed they got some uh, ammunition, including Dum Dum, which would be rounds designed uh, or altered so that they would uh, expand when they, when, they, when they hit something and cause maximum damage. Uh, and, he, and he was caught and he was, he was actually convicted uh, by a court martial and sentenced to two years in jail. Now, in some ways, perhaps the court martial may, may have been mindful that his brother, what had happened to his brother, because other people were convicted of, 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 of possession of, uh, of ammunition, uh, you know, ended up, ended up uh, being executed, you know, or certainly sentenced to death, even if their sentences were later remitted. But that, uh, think of the impact on the family, that meant Mick who ran the farm was gone. And they had to bring, therefore, hire in people who wouldn't necessarily have been as competent or as committed. You know, uh, so so it's a terrible blow uh, to the family's economic security, if you like, as well as just their sense of having lost one son, as Mary Barry had, uh, to the conflict. Now she had lost another, not knowing when he would come back, because could it, would it be months, would it be years? Well, I think Mary Barry is amazingly strong. You know, is is an example of, of of a quietly resilient and purposeful and forward-looking woman. Is uh, 
which I think belies the cliche that uh, women of her age and Catholic background and with lots of children in a short time, my own grandmother, Letter Kenny, had 13 children uh, by the time her husband died when she was 38. You know, and she kept going. She got them all to school and so on, got them all to college or the equivalent. You know, these women weren't, these are Irish Catholic women, rural Irish, who were supported by their religion rather than simply, as we now think, held, held back by it. What kept them going? Uh, in the face of adversity was was, was their own uh, personal faith. And I think nowadays our generation, I'm been like older than you, but the generations underneath us don't really understand the positive as well uh, 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 aspects uh, of, of religious faith, be it Catholic or be it other faiths for people, and particularly for women of women of, of that era. And on that then, is it during that time period or because of what happens during that time period and because of their strong convictions that there is certainly animosity from the Barrys later towards Eamon de Valera and it seems to be hedged around pension or compensation or lack thereof or recognition maybe for Kevin? Well, it's hard to know. I mean, many people... Uh, my own grandmother is the person through whom I, I, I you know, I, I kind of as a kid, I, I was only 14 when she died, but I did s sense her, her sort of antagonism towards Dev. And I couldn't understand it as, as a kid because I knew Dev was the leader, a political leader of the anti treaty side. I didn't know how closely she had worked with them, worked with them then. Well, my grandmother we didn't recognize the free state. You know, she was a proper out and out Republican, except once in 1948, when her friend Sean McBride goes into government, with the bloody blue shirts, with, 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 with John A. Costello, as she would have regarded them, but John A. Costello, uh, with Richard Mulcahy, bloody dick, you know, responsible for all those executions. A, she's quite happy. B, she starts talking to Mulcahy again, right? Mulcahy's the arch enemy of all Republicans. And she, she goes back on, on good terms with him and his wife, who'd been a great friend of hers. And in the, in the 1950s, again, it's in her Bureau of Military History Statement, she refers to them in passing as dick, and she refers to Hugo McNeil, uh, who, who, whom she had known, uh, who'd been in St. Mary's with Kevin, who became an assassin by the time he was 20, and who becomes a significant officer in the Civil War. It said that Hugo McNeil commanded the firing squad that executed the four, four courts leaders in December 1922, a completely non-legal, uh, just on the foot of a government decision. Uh, but she talks about, she refers to McNeil as Hugo, right? And yet she won't. She talks to Dev as the old, uh, the old. You know, she she used nothing but abuse for De Valera, and uh, and so on. But whenever she wanted anything from the state, whenever she got on to Frank Aiken, like a who was Minister for Defence, like a flash, once Mick and her husband applied for military service pensions, she was in the next week saying, Hur "Please hurry these up." And Aiken did hurry. You certainly heard of my grandfather's. I, I haven't seen Nick's file. Uh, uh, you know, when she wanted something from the state, like many anti-state Republicans, she she whistled to former former comrades and got things done. So she, in some ways she's a terrible hypocrite, but aren't we all? And in terms of De Valera did turn up at some of the Barry funerals and there seemed to be a quasi-apology maybe from the Barry family as to some of the treatment he got from them? Well, they shunned him at Mary Barry's funeral, but but then all, all I know is in, in my grandmother's papers, which I gave to UCD many years ago, there's a draft letter from her. Now, I don't know if, if, if she actually sent a letter, but there's a draft letter from her uh, to Dev saying, look, I'm, I'm, I'm really sorry for what happened. We didn't expect to see you there. It's all of us understanding, and we're very, very grateful that you came. So there so there, there, there you go. Um, and I think with the, the animus against Dev is partly, I think he, he, they say he was very high-handed. He stayed in Tom Bay uh, during the Civil War and so on. And, you know, it's said uh, there's family stories about him kind of leaving his boots out to be polished and so on and not saying thank you or saying goodbye, which may have been, you know, which may have been part of it. The pension thing, there's no case. I'm afraid there was no case in law for Mary Barry to get a pension at all because the law was predicated on, on if you had lost a, uh, a child, or uh, you'd lost a, a husband, or you, you'd uh, even later on, if you'd lost a, a brother or sister in, in, in the in the rising or in the war of independence, uh, it was a predicate of you being economically dependent on them. And Kevin, Mary Barry, plainly was wasn't economically dependent on Kevin in, in uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, but at the time of his death, um, and. 
by the, she died in 1953. Uh, there was an effort. Uh, there was an effort to get her a pension because her circumstances changed. But even then, she, if you look at the at the files, she actually had a certain amount of capital, but she didn't want to spend it because she wanted to keep it to leave to her children. So she wasn't, in a sense, uh, sufficiently needy. And that was that. And she inherited a lot of money. I wasn't able to try, follow this up uh, in 1941 when her, when her brother died. At least on paper, she did. Like nearly, four, I think nearly four thousand pounds or so. When her brother uh, uh, P. J. Dowling died in Dublin, who was a successful grocer, and I don't know where that, how much of that money she got or where it might have went. But it's kind of typical within a family that uh, where where you that money might 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 come come to to to, to an elderly person and be dispersed, uh, you know, to avoid uh, all sorts of tax and things over time. But she didn't seem to want, she wasn't, uh, her daughter, Kitby, my grandmother, who never had money but always lived in style, uh, Mary Dowling wasn't like that at all. I met Mary Barry, she, she, she was absolutely, she only needed bare necessities. She never, she never wanted attention and she never wanted, uh, you know, she was, she was very focused on, uh, I think, internally on, 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 on what she what on her loss, but 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 in terms of her children and and grandchildren, she was absolutely looking to the future, not looking to the past. Obviously, the period it's a complex period that we're talking about. If Kevin had been born five, six years earlier, or maybe ten years earlier, any possibility he could have, like many other Irish people, followed John Redmond's advice and joined the British Army and fought in World War One. I think, given his schooling, it's highly likely. I mean, Belvedere, something like just under a hundred boys who've been to Belvedere die in the Great War, right? Uh, that that was what middle class Catholic boys did. Partly, you could argue, to some extent, to, to prove their loyalty, but also to show Ireland, Ireland's fitness for home rule or for for and so on. So and uh, Kitby's brother, my grandfather Jim Maloney, his his his. Youngest half brother, who was four years older than him, William Hannon, was who had been to I'm not sure it was in Rockwell or in Mungrove, but he'd been to a, a fee paying boarding school and so on, as my grandfather was. And what, what did he do in 1914? He joins, gets commissioned in the Royal Irish Rifles, and then then ends up uh, becomes a pilot in the Royal Flying Corps, uh, stays in the British Air Force after this for this after the Great War, and then joins the Free State uh, Army as a, as a pilot in December 1922. Thereby, technically, you know, taking the other side to to his two his his two brothers who were only a few years younger than Jim and Colin, and Colin was you know adjutant general on the other side. It's a typical family story, but but that's about. Uh, about the the schools, the kind of schools that they went to, and the and the kind of associational culture, it would have just been taken as natural that young men would go off to demonstrate that Ireland was fit for self government. And one way was to show that we will fight in in a good cause. So I think it's quite quite likely. What you know, notwithstanding Kevin's uh, strong separatist instincts from 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 an early age, that that he would have done, because most Belvedereans of you know, a few years older than him that's what they had done we know obviously he was initially and for obviously a long time most of the last hundred years he was buried in Mountjoy jail and obviously over the course of time he was joined by nine others famously known as the forgotten ten and i suppose like yourself and myself and many others have referred to them as kevin barry and the forgotten nine and obviously then in 2001 we see a dramatic reinterment state funeral I suppose, what generally do you know about, again, his, his mother, his family's reaction to the fact that he is in Mountjoy, and obviously it takes to another generation to decide that, yes, we're going to exhume all these people. Well, I, I, again, I, I, I'm a generation too late to speak with any authority on this. Uh, my impression is that probably different, uh, when you get to, to nieces and nephews, to, that, uh, to, to the next generation, the di different elements of the family might have had different views uh, as to uh, as to what um, the best thing will be. At different times there were possibilities of, that Kevin would be reinterred, there were possibilities. I think Mrs Barry was given a pass uh, at, uh, in, in the immediately after the war and again uh, 
in the late 1940s to visit the grave if she wished and so on. There was a kind of Robert Emmett argument, oh, you know, he shouldn't be moved until uh, Ireland is free and a republic. Uh, but I, I suspect that over time, and particularly the relation to wider Irish politics, and especially from, from the late 60s on, there might have been different views and so on as to what should happen. It seems to me, I mean, I, I, if they sound all, if you said Kevin Barry and the Forgotten Nine, it's always like a sort of punk group from the 1980s. But I think that uh, my own view is that the, 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 it's always the saddest story that lie, lies in, in, in there. It, it's always isn't Kevin's. It, it would be uh, of men like uh, Patrick Doyle, who, 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 who was uh, executed in March 1921, who, who, who had three children. He saw his infant twin, twin daughters two days before he died, one of those twins dies the day that he's executed. And above all, I think Thomas Trainer, who's from, from Carlo, who's the father of 10 children, one of them a year old, uh, when he's executed. And you have to say, what on earth uh, was, the, uh, was the Dublin IRA doing letting a man with such responsibilities, who'd been out in 1916, who'd done his time in jail, what on earth were they doing letting him near an action? In, in circumstances where where his life would be would be in danger if he were caught, and trainers as you know, I mean, tr I, if you look at trainers' widows' military service pension file, it, it's it, in some ways uplifting, but it's also harrowing. She had to, you know, for this for the for the frugal support that she eventually gets from the state, but but she's there as a widow with ten children trying to get them fed and dressed and educated and it's a you know in some ways it's, it's a hers hers is a heroic story and yet you know the children the grandchildren of, of thomas trainer even if their surnames are trainer nobody's going to say oh are you anthony to thomas trainer whereas uh, uh with a surname a connection with 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 kevin barry even me even i find indirectly and i'm not called kevin or barry but people know it vaguely and it's it's a kind of oh my goodness uh, thing still, whereas I say the trainers, uh, you know, suffered in, in poverty uh, and dignity, but poverty for, 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 for a generation, you know. And on that, in terms of obviously, like so the trainer, Farry, the Barry family, you were consulted about the reinternments, uh, including yourself. What will you use your role in uh, talking with or linking with the likes of the current Kevin Barry, the nephew of Kevin? and the state as regards what was going to happen or how this should happen? Well, I, I mean, I felt like I, I was there involved in those those talks from, uh, I suppose, when they start in, in 2000, they were clearly in some ways a product of, of the peace process uh, in terms of galvanizing the state to, to, to address this, this, this set of issues. Uh, I, I, I was there really as, as a proxy for my late mum, who, who cared about this a lot, and her twin, Helen, who was still alive, Helen Maloney, who wouldn't have been as engaged, uh, uh, sort of uh, emotionally, I think, with it. So, but I, so I was just, a, you know, an available person uh, to represent my side of the family. Uh, I know, it seemed to me the state went through um, Michael Sean Sherwin, a one-time Fianna Foyle, and then Anthony Perrin, TD, uh, did, a, did a, a terrific job in, 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 in dealing not just with, 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 with individual families and different uh, shades of opinion within families, but also in dealing with the National Graves Association, who are you know, a pretty Republican organization, uh, whose representative was an extremely able, sensible person. Uh, and with the very with the prison at the, with the prison authorities with Glasnevin with the defence forces and so on it was, it was at a moment where uh, it was at a constructive moment it seems to me in Irish politics and where 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 uh, where it could be done and where it was done and yet it was viciously attacked in in the the quality press as being uh, uh, both before, both both beforehand and and afterwards, as being you know, Dallas comes to Dublin, absurd kind of headlines and things. And yet, it was a remarkable day. It was a remarkable, absolutely. And you, I presume, great honour for you. You got to carry Kevin's coffin out of Mountjoy. As, as others will tell you, I, I lifted it with with five other men, five other grand nephews, none of whom I'd met before. Well, I met them once before briefly at a, at a trial in Mountjoy. 
But when we lifted the coffin on the day, and it would have been worse for the other families because Kevin's coffin was nearest to the hearse, it weighed a ton because they, it was full of earth. It wasn't just a few bones and it wasn't empty as it had been when we did our dummy run. So, so of course, I at the front nearly thought I was going to drop it because the weight was just ferocious. Mm-hmm. And you know, when you haven't ca- carried something with somebody before, you're not in step. And it was, anyway, it, it, it worked fine. And uh, uh, Kevin had a sense of humor anyway. I think he would have been mm-hmm. amused at our predicament. Predicament, very good. And were you surprised and the family surprised at the reaction on the street? As you say, the press had maybe a different view, but on the day and from watching it on the television that day, I mean, it was an event that, A, it worked spectacularly well in terms of it did what it set out to achieve, and just the general public reaction, it was spontaneous, people going up to the hearses, touching them, you know, that these people became alive again. Yeah, and I, the thing is, I, I don't think that, I think there, it shows, shows you've got to be careful with using the media as your filter. Um, uh, the, the press coverage especially. Most, most of the people I saw, uh, uh, I was sitting in a car, obviously, for most of it, uh, but they weren't, uh, they, these were ordinary people. They weren't, they weren't uh, all uh, sort of uh, committed re- re- contemporary Republicans, if you like. Uh, they, weren't, they, weren't, they weren't there to mock a jeer. They were just ordinary, ordinary men and women, and children. I know it was great. Kevin Barry, a lad of just 18 summers, 1920. What does he say to Irish people of 2020? Well, I think there's several things. I mean, if you look at the, the now the, the number of books about him, first of all, he, he had, a, he, had a, he knew a lot about the world. He, he obviously read newspapers. He, 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 there were all sorts of things that, that he had done and, and that he'd read and written about. Uh, by the time he was 16, 17, 18, because he was of a generation that, that read books, and read newspapers. I don't know. Young people today won't know what I mean even uh, when I say that. Uh, secondly, he clearly had, uh, he was just a lad of 18 summers, but he, he was the end of his first year in, in UCD, and uh, he was a young man, right? And I think that's reflected in the way he carried himself uh, in, in his last uh, couple of months. Uh, he, he's... He, he's uh, I think he shows, uh, irrespective of, of background, he, he, he's, he's an example of why uh, people are willing to willing to fight for, for, uh, to, to fight against established establish authority for what they what they feel is right. You don't have to agree with them uh, at all, but you have to you have to see that this was uh, this was not somebody who stumbled into something because his father said, "Here's a gun." You know, on the contrary, this this was somebody who, who made a conscious decision. Uh, and uh, was willing to say the consequence was willing to kill as well as to be killed. And this, this is a significant factor. I mean, I think it's interesting. There's no sign uh, uh, that he, uh, that, you know, that he's, as it were, uh, he was friendly with his enemies, but he, he did, he wasn't, as far as you know, uh, offering prayers or condolences to the, you know, to, in respect to the people who died, or the soldiers who died amongst Baker and anything like that. He was, you know, uh, in some ways, uh, the soldiers I've met, the people I've met who've done done killing, whether political killing or, or more sort of formal military killing, uh, particularly in wartime, business is business, you know, and uh, you you know you, you do it because you have to, and that's your duty. And then you uh, you know you might I mightn't say a prayer for the people you've killed. You do, you don't claim to enjoy it, but I know I a number of people I've met and been involved in conflicts. Uh, they say in some ways it's terrible, but most most of them say, yeah, has to do it. Pity, but that's that's life, you know? And I think Kevin was like that. I don't think he was haunted by remorse at uh, at what he had done. And I think just as many, uh, be, be they, as we might see them now, terrorists, uh, be they uh, policemen, be they soldiers, then uh, are, uh, I think most of them thought they had a clear enough conscience, you know? And on that then, some people say, well, actually, we shouldn't be commemorating Kevin Barry because of that basis. And worse, he was a medical student and is not the ethos of a medical student. Rule number one, save lives. Well, uh, or at least do no harm. Um, I'm not very sympathetic to that argument. I mean, I think medical students were disproportionately represented in terms of, of 
university students uh, in the in the in the IRA. I think that there's um, a reason why people go, go into medicine in an uplifting reason to, to do what you can for your fellow man. But it doesn't mean that that, that you that you set aside the right uh, and the necessity if you feel it or if your if your country feels it uh, that, that 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 you will fight to defend what what you believe is right. You know, I think it's as simple as that. It's uh, if you look at the uh, in terms of the British military structures and things, the reason that that, that military doctors say in, in, in the First World War and so on, and after it didn't carry weapons is partly because yes, they're doctors and healers, but also because they're really valuable human capital. You know, you can get a soldier to a penny, but to train a doctor takes six or seven years, so you wouldn't want them uh, uh, once they're qualified out there. At the killing end of things, because you need them to fix your people who, who get wounded or you get damaged. And I think that that's the way to think think about it. I don't think it's right, right to say that uh, doctors are necessarily uh, or should have a kind of higher moral calling and so on. It just life's not like that, you know. In terms of writing this book, Kevin Barry, an Irish rebel in life and death, did that weight of Barry family history. Excellent. Good to see it published. Did that sort of Barry family history, the shadow of Kevin Barry, did it weigh down on your shoulders on the sense of I need to write something about this man and also the fact that I'm a professor of history, I'm nearly obliged by the family to write this book? Well, not really, because I mean, partly I, I was going to, we were, I, we were thinking of co-writing it. My second cousin, she, for O'Donovan and I, were going to co-write it, write a book, partly because her father had done a really good book uh, in 1989, uh, which was the wall, as I say, which first made me think of Kevin uh, sort of as something other than a plaster saint. But in the end, we, we, took, we took different routes and we produced two, two very different books. No, I mean, what, what I kind of bring to the party is I, I, I spent a lot of my life studying the British state. My first book was on British government in Ireland, 19, you know, up to 19, up to the, up to August 1920, the Dublin Castle, if you like. I've studied the British Treasury a lot. I've done a lot of work in British intelligence records and so on. So I, 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 I sort of have some sense of the British state's perspectives in these matters. I've written quite a lot about Northern Ireland uh, as well, more recently and so on. But the other thing is that that's, that I, I I, I just completed this huge study, the dead of the Irish Revolution. And one of the, what I think I, I shared with you already, one diagram from it, which actually frankly surprised me. When I looked at Carlow, it's a small county, small Len Leinster County. And when I looked at the number of fatalities by county, which is what I've done from 1917 to 1921. And of the 32 counties in Ireland, uh, uh, if you look at Leinster, which is I think twelve counties, Carlow, there's thirteen deaths I have counted over the over the four years in Carlow, including one man, a spy, brought across the border from 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 Wexford and killed in Carlow. So he's, you know, I count them by where the bodies, where the death happens, rather than the sort of uh, who did it. But so there's a total of thirteen fatalities, which is not a huge number. But when you, when you measure that against the population of Carlo, right, you find that Carlo is, I think it, it's, of the 12 Leicester counties, Carlo was the fifth most violent, right? So it's a very small number, mm -hmm. 13 absolute of deaths, but yet it's in the top half of, of deaths in, in the entire province of Leinster. Yeah. And that's, that's very telling. It tells you the Irish Revolution, as measured by county and deaths, is a very uh, a patchwork quilt and sometimes it's hard to explain if you look at uh, Leash uh, or, or Queen's County if you prefer depending on how old you are uh, which is which is close enough to Carlo right uh, Leash has, has a total of 11 deaths and which is over four years of which two are simply drunk and black and tans going out robbing and killing people right uh, I don't think there's a single British soldier killed in Leash right you know, it's amazing. Uh, and yet Leash had been a really violent county in the 1880s during the land war. Yeah. So we have a set of problems that are, uh, uh, which, which when you're writing a, a, a very sort of family focused thing uh, like Kevin, I think it's useful to have a, wide, a wider view of, of where, of what was happening elsewhere and of why things were happening. And I think, I think my book, uh, uh, help helps in that helps in, the, in that regard.
you know. And I suppose on that, Carlo would have been or had the reputation of being a quiet county. So obviously your your other publication that's coming out, as you say, the dead of the Irish Revolution with Dahi O'Cronin is or Cron is coming out again will probably go deeper than some of the research we've done before on this period. Yeah, but it'll be full. The other thing I have to say, it'll be full of, because it's covering the whole country, there'll be individual accounts of deaths, which at local level, people will say, no, no, that wasn't, wasn't like that. I found already a lot of people have contacted me about, about deaths that I might have written about or referenced, and they might be doing it from the perspective of, of, of a descendant of somebody who'd been involved, but some of them are descendants of people who were killed or families who, who left because they're, uh, you know, somebody in the family had been killed or threatened and people move and they move quietly, but they move and they leave the area. In some cases, they leave the country. And there is a kind of hid, hidden history, not only of Irish revolutionaries, but of people impacted by the Irish revolution, uh, which which I think increasingly were, 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 were beginning just at the beginning of uncovering. Yeah, and speaking of that, obviously, while we have lots of archives, access to a lot of material about our various uh, characters from our past, including like Sir Kevin Barry, but there is always, as you know, the off chance that in a suitcase or in an attic or in a press somewhere, someone's going to come across something. And what would your recommendation be to them if they come across something that's of relevance? Look, uh, the reason that that, that there, there's a that there's a, a big Kevin Barry collection and a Cathy Barry collection, Cathy Barry Maloney collection, and a Paddy Maloney collection in UCD is because isn't because I'm a historian. It's because I was told there were no papers, and it was only when I was selling my my grandparents' house that I found in in a not a concealed but in, in just a, a, a quietly built away sort of storage area. I found a huge collection of papers relating to Kevin, relating to my grandmother, relating to my grandfather, to my uncle, and to my aunt Catherine's husband, Patrick Cavanagh, right? And they, I've been told there was nothing. And everywhere you go, there's sheds. In County Monaghan, a relative of mine, uh, uh, he had papers his father had given him, but never told him what they were in a, in a biscuit tin. And when he opened the biscuit tin after his father died, his father said, "You got to deal with this stuff." There was there's a, there's a there was a a Mauser automatic, right? Uh, there was an account of uh, very detailed accounts of 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 a, of a, of a Monaghan battalion, uh, its activities in the War of Independence, and there was an, a very gripping, gripping, incomplete account of the killing of of a neighbour of this guy's, a woman called Kate Carroll, whom Tom Brennan, my in fact my, my first cousin's grandfather, had investigated. And had initiated the killing. He, he he did it under orders. But this and the account, his personal account, is so harrowing that he just does et cetera. He doesn't say what happens to her. And then he continues the next page and 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 doesn't mention that we took her out on, on the mountain and we shot her, right? And there's everywhere you go, everywhere there is material, whether it's dramatic like that, whether it's ordinary and mundane, they gosh, oh, that wouldn't no be interesting. That's just a few old papers. And the result is, as you know, I, I was in, I used the C C Carlo uh, uh, Museum and Archives for, for my Kevin research, but there wasn't much there of relevance to the War of Independence. That's not, that's not because you're not looking for material, it's because people hang on to it. Mm. They don't know what to do with it. And so what happens is you get, whether it's a chicken shed, I don't know if you have chicken sheds anymore, but it's, you, you still have a thing called must, and you still have, you still have rodents called, called mice and, and rats. And you still have you still have just a mess, and you still have people dying, and then the next generation knowing what these old papers are about, and the only safe place for them is in in institute, the kind of institutions that you have. And nowadays, because of technology, you can scan anything, and give the originals back to the family, so they'd have a complete record. Yeah. But, but it's tragic how much gets lost, and not only of, of high high of sort of of well known figures, uh, and like like Kevin, for example, but of people we've never you know. We don't know about the or, about ordinary people because their or their records don't survive because families think they're not important or because they get lost. So you should be the people should be bringing stuff into you seven days a week. <laughs> Thanks very much, <laughs> yeah. Professor Union O'Halpin, author of Kevin Barry, an Irish Rebel in Life and Death, just published and obviously forthcoming, The Dead of the Irish Revolution. 
Best of luck with those publications and thank you very much on behalf of Carlow County Council's Decade of Centenaries Committee, Carlow County Library and Carlow County Museum, Gorham Agus. Okay, thanks very much to you and to John and, and to everybody. This has been very interesting for me uh, and uh, I hope it's of use to the people of Carlow and, and anyone else who watches it. Cheers.